Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our webinar today on how AI is revolutionizing the F&B industry, presented by SG Innovate and General Assembly. My name is Brian, and for those of you who don't know about us, we are a government-backed investor in Singapore with the mission to build deep tech innovations. At SG Innovate, our work involves connecting with the global deep tech ecosystem, working with entrepreneurial scientists to bring their innovative research from lab to market, as well as developing deep tech talent. Today, we have an amazing panel of speakers who will be discussing how companies in the F&B industry can successfully tap into the benefits of AI for their business. I would also like to encourage our audience here today to share their thoughts on this topic and engage with our speakers by using the Q&A box below. And with no further ado, I will pass the time to Seema from General Assembly. Seema, please. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Seema. I am the Partnerships Manager at General Assembly Singapore. For those of you who may not be familiar with General Assembly, we are a tech education company. So we focus on full-time and part-time courses, and those are in data science, software engineering, UX design, and digital marketing. We also have um, shorter workshops, which hone in on specific skill sets, and then we host a whole bunch of free events just like this. We partner very closely with IMDA, uh, via the TIPP program, um, which does allow subsidies for any of our immersives, our full-time immersives around the four that I mentioned, data science, software engineering, UX design, and digital marketing. Um, so if you want to learn more, do check out our website. Uh, there's a whole bunch of information on there. But in the meantime, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass the, uh, pass the time over to Anshul so we can talk about how AI is revolutionizing the F&B industry. Anshul, over to you. Thanks, Seema. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks for organizing this. And everyone, uh, really a good afternoon and welcome to today's session. Hopefully, we'll have some interesting conversations about the topic today, how AI is revolutionizing the FNB industry. Before we get into uh, that, let me uh, introduce myself and then I'll let the other panelists introduce uh, themselves as well. I'm Anshul. I'm uh, a co-founder of a company called tapsquare.ai. Uh, we provide AI-powered restaurant digitalization software uh, for the restaurant industry, uh, really trying to uh, use data and AI to not only improve cu uh, customer experience uh, at, uh, when you go for, uh, for, for a meal at the restaurant, but also leveraging the, the capabilities to help uh, reduce some of the pain points that the restaurant industry faces, uh, improve their efficiency and improve their profitability as well. Um, let me uh, let me let me get uh, the other uh, panelists to to introduce themselves. Maybe shall I go? Uh, I'm Phil Helfried. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm the chief operating officer of Evan Flow Group. Um, we're a technology-driven uh, F&B group based here in Singapore. Um, and what we do is we build and we acquire F&B brands, uh, a wide range ranging from FMCG uh, products to uh, your regular sort of ready to eat meals. Um, and we also do the same for technologies, food related technologies. And there's a range of tech that we build and acquire there as well, um, consumer facing as well as operationally focused ones. Thanks, Phil. Uh, hi, I'm Soom, the co-founder and CEO of AI Pallet. At AI Pallet, we help the food and beverage companies with the new product innovation. For example, if a beverage company wants to launch a new juice in a market like Thailand, our platform will help them identify what kind of juice they should launch next so that it is successful. And in order to do that, we use the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris. I'm from IMDA. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, IMDA is the government agency that actually develops and regulates the infocom and media sectors. So my role in IMDA is uh, largely leading the AI program office. And the program office is uh, actually in charge of uh, accelerating the adoption of uh, artificial intelligence by local enterprises. So I will be very happy to share some of the the areas that we're working on along the way. And uh, personally for myself, I'm a very keen uh, AI enthusiast. And uh, I actually did some uh, research in AI uh, way back in, in, in two, probably around two decades ago. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone. Uh, so let's get started. Um, 
So let's start at the basics, right? Uh, why do we think FNB industry needs AI in the first place? Uh, if you really think about the FNB industry, it's a very high touch industry, has been very service driven industry. Uh, and what do we feel whether AI makes life better or worse for the FNB owners, diners? Uh, and does it take away from the very concept of FNB or does it add to it? Uh, we have a lot of uh, experience uh, on uh, on that area with the panelists here. So let me let me ask this question to uh, our panelists and then uh, uh, discuss this point first before we get into more details of how uh, the, the AI can impact the FNB industry. Um, Philip, why, why don't you take a dig at it first? Since sure. uh, uh, operate a lot of FNB uh, concepts already. Sure, yeah, I, I think uh, you raise an interesting Point or an important point, which is the high touch uh, uh, part and component of FNB, um, and the way we think about AI in, in FNB is really more from a decision-making perspective. So uh, we 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 feel that traditionally, you know, the FNB industry is driven by very passionate chefs. Um, so things like branding and menu creation and product development um, come from that same perspective, from from a passion perspective. And I think we, the approach that Evan Flow tries to take is to take, uh, take an approach to product development um, much more like a technology company. So, uh, you know, we still want the chefs to infuse their and inject their passion into the products that they make, um, but just to make a, a more informed decision. So for us, it's really about analyzing data and using AI uh, to come to a more refined product ultimately that we know the market really wants. Yeah, so I'll uh, probably a little bit build up on, on what uh, Phil mentioned. Uh, so absolutely, AI can uh, uh, help in decision making. And also one of the other reasons why we need to consider AI in today's age is because the pace of change has been pretty significant. Consumer preferences are now changing faster than ever before. So the stuff that people used to like probably last year may not be relevant today. And the way we can be on top of those kind of change and track those changes in real time, and maybe even better if we can anticipate what are those changes are coming, then as a FNB company, I can create those lineup of products and go to the market and tap on that changes already here. And the other reason, which is a strong uh, reason on why we can look at AI now, is also because the data that we need to train the AI models and for the machine to learn is abundant now. And, and that was not the case uh, uh, so few, several years back. So with the coming of the POS devices, the digitization of the menus, and also f and as, uh, as an industry is really popular among the consumers. So the consumers are constantly sharing uh, the stuff that they are consuming through the different platforms that they use. So analyzing all this data, we, are, we can today identify what the consumer preferences and trends are moving and thus aid the F&B companies uh, to create the products which the consumers will love. I think, uh, well, I'm not an F&B expert myself, but I think generally coming from, you know, from a customer experience, I think definitely as what uh, uh, Som and Phil has mentioned um, in terms of having a more personalized approach. In fact, I think there's this term called hyper-personalization, right? Um, it's a matter of how much can we achieve and, and how much investment uh, the firms are actually uh, getting to, to basically digitize their touch points so that they can acquire the data um, to, to kind of achieve this hyper-personalization uh, impact. So as a consumer, I think definitely a lot uh, that can be beneficiary. And uh, right, you know, if you go to a steak restaurant and then you, you actually get the steak done right to, to really to your own personal uh, craving, right, and 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 that kind of uh, individualized uh, experience, I think it means a lot, and and it can actually help to improve the the top line potentially, and I think beyond the touch point, uh, you know, uh, front facing aspect pot potentially, I think that could also be an angle from operation efficiencies. I think coming from FNC CG angle, right, uh, in terms of the, even from from uh, getting the right kind of supply uh, to the kitchen. And then from the kitchen, obviously, to the plate. And I think this end-to-end -end, uh, concept can be very data-driven. And of course, uh, AI can play a big part of it. Oh, very, very valid points. And just to kind of build on to, to this discussion, uh, definitely uh, um, from Tapscript's perspective, right? we 
we try to digitalize the interaction between the restaurant and the cu uh, customer. And there comes the situation where you have a lot of data, both from the operation side, or, you know, what is selling, how many tables are occupied, et cetera, but a lot of rich data from consumer behavior as well. And if you look today, uh, it's not just the FNB industry. Uh, if you start looking a bit beyond the FNB industry, uh, even entertainment, for example, right? When you open a Netflix app, based on the kind of content you have consumed in the past, the kind of movies, actors, genres uh, uh, that, you have, uh, that you have watched at Netflix, it will automatically give you recommendations of what uh, other content might be suited to your tastes. Now, just try to, to bring that concept to, 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 uh, uh, to FNB based on what I have eaten in the past, what, what kind of uh, taste profile I have. If I can start uh, you know, hyper-personalizing the dining experience, it becomes really, really rich. And while this industry has been very high touch, uh, what it stops at when you are doing this manually but through a staff is, okay, you can teach the staff if a customer is ordering a beer, recommend a chicken wings to them, right? But uh, uh, that's great, but I don't like spicy food. I don't like chicken, I'm a vegetarian. What, what That recommendation does not have any impact on the customer. It's, it's, a, it's a useless recommendation for me as a customer, right? But uh, uh, using AI technology, if we can identify that this customer actually likes vegetarian food, it's very easy to re uh, replace that recommendation of chicken wings with maybe a cheese nachos or a French fries, which makes it far more relevant uh, to even to the end customer. So when we talk about, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, personal service, the high touch service that can be taken to a completely different level with hyper-personalization, even from a consumer perspective, uh, not only talking about the benefits that you can see from an operational perspective, decision-making, absolutely. But even uh, from a consumer perspective, I think there's a huge scope uh, uh, to 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 take the the dining experience itself uh, to uh, to the next level with hyper personalization and uh, and taking that high touch definition to really going to each single customer and saying what is the best experience that I can offer you and I mean uh, if if you think about it right like the coffee shop that we really love is where I go to the, uh, to the coffee shop and I don't even have to order because they already know I like my coffee with soy milk, an extra shot of espresso and extra hot. And that's the, that's the, the definition of, uh, you know, this is my, uh, 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 that this is the, the kind of experience I want to give each customer with AI and, uh, and data and personalization, you can actually get towards that much, much more than you could ever with, uh, with uh, just staff. Uh, uh, Philip, uh, uh, what, what do you think of uh, application of AI on the on the consumer side of it uh, as well? Yeah, I think the the way I, I think about innovation uh, in this context is, I guess, there's product innovation and there's process innovation, and uh, and to the point of consumer facing technologies, it's something that we are entering this year. Um, I think AI is is less relevant direct sort of consumer facing like apps, for example, uh, from our perspective, media plays a very big role uh, in, in, in consumer facing uh, technologies and applications, because we feel that um, currently consumers, I, I think, are used to scanning QR codes to see digital menus, um, but it doesn't make for a very immersive experience. And so, again, we think a lot about experience as well versus just selling the product. And the idea is that uh, these digital touch points for the consumers should really act as sort of enhancers of the dining experience versus just information transfer like a menu. Um, but with regards to AI specifically or data, data analysis, that's where I draw the distinction between product innovation and process innovation. And product innovation, I think, is probably more where AI palette uh, is, is focused on identifying trends and then developing products that the market wants. That's something that we do as well, um, more for consumer, not, not FMCG products. Um, and then process, I think, is, is one that is possibly even a little bit easier to, to have um, quick wins in. So uh, you mentioned that data is available, operational data is available, but sometimes that's not true. Uh, or sometimes the data is available, but it's not very, um, it's not very legible. So uh, I think what a lot of 
uh, f and players in Singapore have, have experienced in the last 12 months or so is uh, they're on all of these different delivery platforms, Deliveroo, Grab Food, Food Panda. And for every brand that they have, uh, they need to have a separate tablet. Yeah. So if you operate multi-concept kitchens the way we do, um, what you end up with is uh, with nine or 12 tablets that people in the kitchen, that our staff in the kitchen have a minute. And the data is, is very different. The reports are, for example, very different between each of these platforms. So I think there's a lot to be done on, on the operational side of FNB uh, to make kitchen operations run smoother, to make deliveries run more efficiently. Um, I think that ultimately, obviously, uh, the consumer ultimately benefits from that as well, right? Uh, the food arrives in, in a better condition. Uh, it arrives faster. You can possibly uh, lower delivery fees, etc. So those are sort of the areas that, that we're looking at. But on the consumer-facing uh, application side, like you mentioned, I think media is, a, is, a, is more of a focus for us rather than uh, sort of classic AI the way we would, we would consider it. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, let me delve a bit deeper into some of these uh, pain points that uh, that you uh, that you uh, think that AI and data can can uh, uh, can help uh, on from an FNB perspective. Uh, it, it would be great if, uh, from your own experiences, if you can share some uh, some case studies or some areas where you have applied, uh, you know, data and AI capabilities. Uh, how did you do it? What were the kind of results that you saw, and where you are planning to take it next? In terms of consumer focus, or uh, uh, whichever area that you have uh, actually applied it, and uh, sure. seen some results. So, I mean, I, I think our first application of AI was through um, a partnership, actually, with a company called Stream Technologies, um, and so they've been our partners for, for about two years now. Uh, and what Scream do is they uh, analyze consumer behaviors. Um, I think they take a slightly different approach or we take a slightly different approach to AI palette um, in that uh, we look at consumer trends that are not necessarily specific to food and beverage. It's more uh, overarching themes and trends. Um, and what we do is we construct a consumer profile. Um, and these consumer profiles are then condensed into a brief a product brief, a brand brief, um, which is handed to our chefs in the kitchen uh, who will start developing products uh, and, and crafting menus. And it's also handed to our uh, branding and creative team. And so the idea is to use these insights based on a very specific targeted consumer uh, persona that we've established using the AI insights um, in order to develop a brand and a product that we know a certain segment is already looking. Um, and really what it's allowed us to do is to develop these products, not just um, in a more targeted way, but also in a faster way. So our go to market, uh, again, traditionally, you know, you, you'd spend a few weeks, maybe months developing a menu, uh, then you'd find a kitchen and an outlet and, and uh, I think a lot of KPEX uh, into, into setting up a restaurant. And so we avoid that by setting up small operations in, in a cloud kitchen, or we partition a section of an existing outlet. Um, and that's where we run a test of, of these brands that we've created for delivery only. And based on the feedback, then that creates a feedback loop, which goes back into our, our AI. So uh, any, any example from, from your experience uh, where you have helped leverage data or AI to, to, to solve some of these pain points? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we identified trends in uh, multiple ways. So one of the uh, my favorite uh, uh, examples that we did recently was uh, for one of the large confectionery companies. Uh, they wanted to understand what are the new consumption occasions that have come up post COVID-19. So confectioneries, they're typically consumed in occasions like where you have a birthday party or wedding where people come together and uh, consume confectionery. But because of social distancing measures, those kind of events are becoming less and less possible. So using our technology, we were able to identify uh, several new consumption occasions that have come out post COVID-19. So for example, a virtual party over Zoom or a small parties at home or backyard barbecue parties. So and how it helped that particular company is that then they reposition their existing products, 
targeting those new consumption occasions which their competition were still not tapping into and thus even though uh, the usual consumption occasions were not possible they were still able to maintain their sales so so the analysis was in terms of uh, how the 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 usage occasions are are, are changing uh, with the same kind of uh, uh, products yeah so what we did was that we analyzed the data that the consumers uh, uh, had shared in terms of the consumption of conf- confectionery uh, post covid 19 and pre covid 19 and when you run the analysis we identified this bunch of new consumption occasions which never existed before that and then it was uh, quite apparent that they need to go after them sure chris uh, any uh, from imds perspective have you come across any applications that you have seen are uh, really being successful uh, uh, and that has really helped the fmb industry i think coming from uh, our perspective uh, we we actually have a different uh, engagement with uh, different sectors um i think the closest to fmb that uh, currently my team is working on is uh, actually in the retail industries where i think there there's a lot of same similarities in terms of having uh, this customer touch points and a lot of readily uh, available data for analysis So right now I think we are looking at uh, how we are working with some of the potential platform players for example like points of sales platform players to uh, kind of co-develop a new kind of recommendation engine uh, including more at once uh, functionality such as uh, smart reward right which can be potentially implemented and I think that is a kind of uh, angle that we are looking at to capitalize on on the excess of data I think from the initial tests and 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 studies i think there are really a lot of positive uh, feedback coming from from some of these uh, implementations right and perhaps also to draw a little bit from my previous experience uh, before i joined imd i think i came from a, also a very consumer uh, facing industry from a telco actually so um, probably some of you might have known that telco is very big into some, a lot of this uh, an- analysis of the consumer data because the whole overall customer journey means a lot Uh, to us and then at, at the same time there's a lot of ways to actually capture all these touch points so the entire customer journey is actually captured and and we can actually use it to develop new uh, so called products right uh, that is uh, more tailored to certain segments and i think that's those are the very uh, very down to earth and grounded uh, applications of uh, ai in in the so called the consumer facing side of the business yeah. 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 interesting i mean uh, the, the, as i was sharing from my uh, our own experience and what we have kind of uh, implemented at uh, our restaurants uh, we uh, two parts to it right one is the operational part what philip was also talking about <clears throat> really um, i think to make ai uh, implementable or leveraging the power of ai the what comes first is really the data so from a operational perspective as philip was saying uh, today leveraging uh, tabsco technology you can not only connect with the consumers in store but on your own online channel or on all any of the delivery platforms all through one uh, one uh, uh, one device one menu uh, as well so what you were talking about philip you really don't need uh, 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 10 15 devices anymore you can see all the orders coming from all different channels um, uh, third party channels your own uh, online shop Uh, as well as in store you can see all those orders in one place and that gives a lot of interesting insights not only in terms of what is your sales and trends etc but really what is your kitchen utilization for example so today uh, you can track uh, my kitchen my 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 uh, restaurant might not be full at uh, a particular period in time but my kitchen is uh, you know uh, over utilized because there are hundreds of orders coming from the different delivery platforms and my own delivery online delivery uh, solution as well so that is more on, on uh, in terms of the operational and data analysis part but uh, as i was talking earlier what we have also try to do is really look at uh, what consumers are ordering uh, when when they're dining across different uh, platforms uh, and uh, trying to understand and creating like a, a food profile it, it's not uh, in terms of a persona or a, a large segment but really creating a individual a, a food profile for each consumer trying to see what are her what are the uh, uh, you know taste profile what is the flavor profile what is uh, what is the typical kind of proteins uh, that they prefer uh, 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 carb profile etc the baking style or the cooking style that they prefer and really creating almost like a a, a Uh, a, a food persona by customer, and then trying to uh, also create a, 
uh, what we call in our language almost like a dish DNA, where every dish is uh, divided into 400 plus factors, really understanding uh, you know, the ingredients, the cooking style, the flavor profile. And then we try to match that uh, with the, the consumer persona. And the menu that you look at uh, might be different from the menu that Chris looks at uh, in the restaurant. So that uh, you, uh, instead of trying to look through uh, 150, 200 items in the menu, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the system automatically is able to pull out which are the items that are more, which uh, you will have more affinity towards. And same applies to even giving recommendations when you're ordering a particular dish, which other dish might go well uh, 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 with, with that. So really a personalized recommendation engine as well. And uh, at least for now, uh, what we see across the restaurants uh, where we have implemented these systems, we have seen almost 15 to 20% increase in average uh, spend by consumers in those restaurants as well. So uh, 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 again, one, one of the uh, case examples where we have really leveraged AI technology to not only improve the customer experience, but at the same time, improve the, the, the profitability by increasing the revenue for the restaurants as well. Uh, again, many, many such applications we see of AI in FNB. Uh, this is just one example that, uh, that we have been working on for, for, <coughs> for, for a couple of years now. Okay, before I move forward in our discussion, let me take a few questions that uh, some of the uh, participants have uh, have raised, some of the audiences raised. Um, and, um, uh, Alan asks, assuming the technology consumer industry are ready, what is holding the transformation back? Chris, uh, you, you want to give it a go first because you see it across many different industries as well. Thanks, Anshu. I think, okay, um, first of all, I think coming from the government's perspective, we have actually uh, done very regular assessment of the overall uh, digital landscape in Singapore. And uh, we, we recognize that, you know, largely from the local enterprise point of view, there is still a, kind of a big gap and uh, still pretty nascent in terms of AI adoption. And I think generally speaking, I think um, when we look at it dive, uh, deeper, uh, we recognize that there are several key uh, kind of uh, issues that we need to address. I think first of all, I think as what a few might have alluded to, um, the key part of our AI adoption is actually about the data availability. And um, not all enterprises are actually in a ready state to kind of uh, have a ready clean data for AI and ML. Um, the reason is because even if they have a lot of digital touch point, they may not have organized the data and you know store the data and manage the data in an efficient way uh, so that they can actually build services on top of it or applications on top of it. So that's, that's actually a big, big part of, uh, of so-called the, the hurdles uh, that some of the local enterprises are facing. And of course, uh, with data comes with the, the cost of implementations uh, of such a data architecture, right? The second uh, potential uh, reason uh, with regards to holding this transformation back is it could be due to the lack of uh, so manpower um, because a lot of these uh, enterprises, the core focus is largely in, in the business, like in this case is F&B, right? So um, it will be a little bit odd to expect a restaurant to kind of like have an AI expert within the restaurant organization. So how do we actually help some of these uh, local players? Uh, that's where, uh, from the government standpoint, actually, uh, that's where we want to drive uh, new new programs to kind of uh, avail some of these uh, services as a common uh, digital services or, or some kind, even from a data point of view, to avail to the industry some kind of a digital commons to help uh, uplift our local uh, players in terms of adoption of AI. So that is another angle, so-called the lack of uh, resources uh, from a manpower and also from an asset standpoint. Yeah. So just broadly speaking uh, from, from the perspective of, of uh, IMDA. Yeah. Um, Philip, so would you like to yep. uh, contribute Let me to that? add to it uh, because that's one of the things that I also face when I <laughs> try to work with the clients. So, uh, I mean, uh, to build up on what Chris mentioned about the challenges when it comes to building a sense, uh, uh, AI solution uh, for the internal data. I'll, I'll also talk a little bit about when you don't need the data yourself from the company. The data is already available out there and you can build the models until uh, help them use that solution. So uh, there are a few challenges uh, that uh, we see always, uh, uh, the similar challenges across multiple uh, players. So first of all is the in general impression of AI. 
so people have very different impressions of ai probably you have to blame the hollywood movies for it <laughs> on one side uh, we see the super computers which have answered to everything and on the other hand we have the terminators which will uh, take over humanity uh, but <laughs> the reality as we know that it lies somewhere in between so uh, the first of all uh, a lot of people there is the fear of ai or the limitation in terms of the uh, understanding of ai and for those who are open to adopt ai solution they also need to understand the limitations of ai that ai cannot function independently today you need to use the ai along with the human intelligence ai can only give you the information but the ultimate decision needs to be made by you so there is a gap in terms of understanding of the ai among the general uh, population and finally uh, the biggest hurdle is the mindset of the people uh, people by nature are resistant to change if a particular way has worked uh, for them for several years uh, changing them into a new way of looking uh, things and trying things uh, it's another challenge when it comes to adaptation of a very new uh, technology like ai where you have to completely change and rewire yourself the way you do certain things um i mean uh, i i think the the common theme uh, which uh, which we experienced in the past as well is again the the absence of data in a usable form right the the companies who have the data are not doing anything with it the people the companies who are doing something with it don't have the data so there is a huge disconnect between uh, uh, having the data in a clean form and being actually be able to use that and uh, which becomes a huge impediment i mean from tapscript's perspective I, i can say thankfully from our uh, because we are into digital uh, digitalizing the restaurant industry we get a lot of data and hence that problem is less acute for us but uh, definitely I, i can imagine um, a, a lot of companies who are building ai products the the absence of data in a usable form takes a huge amount of effort, effort to get into that form and then only you can you, you can actually leverage that Philip, what 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 about you? What what do you think? Yeah, I think I mean I agree with everything. I think that we've that we've just mentioned. Uh, I I also see a very big disconnect between uh, people who build and companies who build uh, AI solutions and technologies in general and FMB operators. So FMB operators traditionally just aren't exposed to these kind of new solutions. Uh, they've not used technology in the past. um and and beyond the POS system uh the point of sale system and some of the delivery platforms that's really uh, the sort of the exposure that they're limited to and so what we're a bit uniquely kind of uniquely positioned uh because we operate uh outlets and brands and kitchens ourselves as well as building the tech and so the approach that we've always taken is um the, and to the point of data who looks at the data and it's not the chefs the chefs are not meant to look at the data uh, the chefs don't really care uh what data you're gathering either they just want the system that they're using to work and so we don't want to design stuff that looks fancy to engineers we want to build something that chefs find is very useful and usable and so in designing and in particular on the operational side designing any of for example our kitchen management software which is a platform that all of our kitchens uh, are currently using uh, so they use iPads basically to process all of the orders and so we go paperless um and and those systems are designed uh you know not from the ground up by the engineers and our product designers uh but we actually sit down with the chefs and say what is your workflow like and let's build something that matches your workflow instead of forcing them into a new workflow uh because you'll just face a lot of resistance the other thing that i find interesting is uh, how people perceive data um and i've noticed that a lot of people uh so if an ai if you run an ai engine and it gives you some insights uh if they seem true uh if they seem obvious then the normal reaction is well i knew that already and if the insights seem very innovative and radical they say well it can't be true and so the you know the the challenges as well uh first of all believing believing the ai because obviously it it is crunching data uh and and it is true uh certainly statistically speaking um and then how do you craft how do you communicate the insights generated by the ai such that everyone in the organization buys into the idea 
because if they don't buy in, then there's really no point. Then the, the engineers are happy and the data scientists are happy, um, but the business decisions are not based, made based on that data. No, uh, absolutely uh, true, Philip. We see that quite a bit as well. And uh, adding on to what Chris said earlier, right? Um, I think the, the one part of the problem is the data. And the second part of the problem is also how do you use it? Okay, chefs can't use it. You have a team that can help them understand the output and then use it. But what about you know small mom and pop stores? How can how can you make uh, data and AI capabilities available to them? That needs to be done at scale, and you can't expect them to have a data scientist sitting inside their uh, uh, you know uh, uh, in their organization because probably they are managing the restaurant themselves and probably serving the food. Uh, they can't afford to have a data scientist sitting and doing that analysis. And I think uh, the, the the role. Uh, as an industry player, we, we also need to play, uh, start looking at and playing is how can we make this into a more scalable system, right? Um, for example, uh, at Tabsquare, at least uh, what our attempt is that uh, you have large chains like McDonald's, et cetera, right? Like they have actually bought a uh, AI company which does the personalization and everything uh, and they can pay $300 million to, to get that capability. But the, the, the next door cafe uh, does not even have $300 to pay for, uh, for that capability, right? So really, uh, how can you make AI available in a form where um, the capabilities of the technology is available in a form where uh, it's as simple as subscribing to it, where I, I say, okay, yes, I want uh, to leverage these technologies. I want to look at this data. I want to leverage this to, to impact my, my restaurant operations. Can it be made into a kind of almost like a subscription-based model where uh, yeah, it's it's available to even the smallest uh, hawker stall uh, uh, if required, right? And uh, our attempt at Tab Square has been to really, uh, we have a, a huge team of data scientists, but always the attempt is not to, not to create uh, specific solutions for one, uh, one large chain, but really a, a solution which is applicable it may not be applicable to 100% of the types of restaurants at this point in time, but at least the attempt is how can we make it mass? How can we make it available to the, the smallest shop that, that wants to embark upon the journey? But where, where we struggle, uh, and I think uh, uh, IMDA does play an important role in, in pushing that uh, objective uh, as well, is really awareness. We have been able to find a, pro a solution for data. Our solutions give us enough data. We have been able to find a solution to how to make them use it uh, because we have built the system in a way where it is scalable. But the biggest problem comes in awareness where how do I teach the, the, the small coffee shop owner saying that AI and data is important. It can improve your operations because right now in his mind, he's struggling with, oh, I need my staff to make my food. I need to, uh, to collect my money. I need to, uh, you know, manage these delivery orders uh, uh, that are coming from grab food panda delivery so how do I, how do you educate them in terms of understanding that this can actually help your business uh, uh, and it's simple to adopt and it doesn't sound like uh, you know uh, as Soma was saying a uh, bollywood science fiction kind of a concept that oh no it is not for me it is not applicable in my con uh, uh, context so i think uh, a lot more work needs to be uh, uh, needs to be done in uh, in that uh, in that space as well. And I think IMDA has been uh, with the entire DRB scheme, et cetera. There was a full section on just, you know, use AI and use data and, and, and leverage it to whatever extent. I think a lot of restaurants have taken advantage of that, but a lot more uh, still needs to be done uh, in that area, at least what, uh, what we are seeing uh, as well. Um, okay, let me let me take a, uh, it's been a very heavy discussion. So let me take a, a bit more uh, tongue in cheek question from Tang. Um, she, uh, uh, the, uh, they're asking, uh, can an AI chef win a future edition of MasterChef? Philip, I think the, this question, you are, uh, Philip and Som, you are the best guys to answer that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I would defer to my, one of my earlier points around experience. And uh, it's really what the consumer wants. Um, so I, can an AI in future um, create new dishes 
very tasty dishes by itself, probably, uh, I, I would say. Um, but I think that that's ignoring the fact that um, I think consumers um, really experience food in, in a very unique way versus other products, right? So it's, it's sort of, we think of food bringing people together, right? So you go dine out with your friends and you meet new people, you go for drinks. And so I think a human element is, is, is it's not a question of whether it's possible. I think it's people want that human element. Um, which is why even in the age of QR codes and digitization, you still see most restaurants um, and, and dine-in locations uh, having stuff because people just like to be welcomed at the door. That would be that would be my that would be my answer. So come on, Let's I'll, I'll, I'll answer it in a slightly different way. Uh, so. In the uh, immediate future, I don't think that AI will be able to win the MasterChef, but I'm pretty sure the next MasterChef would be somebody who would use AI. <laughs> so I, uh, I see the future in such a way where along with the chef, there would be a data scientist who will be working in his <laughs> laptop and will come out with the list of ingredients that he should use. And then the chef, he takes it up and goes to the kitchen and does his magic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I would say we are uh, still a bit far, further away from uh, from uh, letting our AI chef win the master chef. Um, I mean, we, we see that uh, uh, in our uh, uh, just trying to uh, to think through what best dishes to recommend itself is a is a huge task, right? Because out of the two hundred items, which are the items that that particular customer might like. Uh, that itself uh, uh, is quite uh, quite a uh, task, and uh, I think uh, what uh, Philip was pointing out uh, as well. It's not just about putting the ingredients together, but what goes well with that. So it still needs a bit of further development, I think, from an AI perspective before we can get a AI master chef. Um, okay, let me answer one. Uh, uh, take up another question uh, from Tanya. Uh, uh, can you talk about some use cases on how you have leveraged in-venue QR code ordering platforms to generate insights and implement better CX personalization cross-sell upsell opportunities? I think uh, I, I spoke about that uh, a little while back. Um, so what we do is that really uh, uh, looking at consumer behavior uh, in terms of what uh, they are ordering in, uh, at different points in time and really uh, breaking it down into uh, creating a profile for the customer saying that these are the, the top, uh, you know, taste profiles that uh, they like. These are the top protein profiles they like, etc. And trying to match that. And in terms of the ordering interface, the way it looks like is one, it remembers what you like to order, right? So if you, as I was explaining, if you like your coffee with soy milk, extra espresso, uh, extra shot of espresso and extra hot, it remembers all of that. But beyond that, based on what you have ordered in the past, it will also give you recommendations from the menu that uh, uh, that you might like uh, at that particular restaurant. And the entire interface is actually um, changed for each customer in the sense that uh, maybe for me, a beef burger is the top recommended item in the menu. But for uh, Chris, for example, it would be a, 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 a chicken stew, for example. I'm just taking an example, Chris. <laughs> uh, but really, um, uh, what we are able to do is really uh, the, uh, the entire UI and UX is based on data and uh, the customer profile uh, and personalization for that particular customer. In fact, we have gone to an extent of, uh, we are actually able to now uh, even create uh, dynamic promotions uh, for each customer dynamically as well. So uh, maybe the restaurant wants to give uh, uh, $2 off on a beverage, but uh, Som likes uh, green tea uh, Chris likes uh, soda and Philip likes uh, 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 a juice, right? Uh, it is actually, our system is actually able to see what is the, the best personalized dish or, or the beverage that can be uh, given as a promotion to that uh, customer such that one, he has a better experience, but two, the, the restaurant also sees much better adoption of the kind of promotions that they want to run. So these are some of the examples of uh, how um, personalization of the user experience of promotions of the recommendations that you give can actually uh, can actually improve 
the experience for the customer and help the restaurants make some more uh, money as well. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I think we have had a, a quite an interesting discussion, uh, but what I would love to also understand is any, um, uh, where do you see the future, right? Like where do you see, today we are struggling with a lot of uh, issues in terms of data, in terms of scalability, in terms of awareness, et cetera. But let's try to take a view three years, five years down the line. Where do you see um, uh, what kind of role AI playing in the FNB industry? Um, I think AI currently, uh, this is something that we've mentioned that, uh, you know, the people using and looking at the data are engineers, data scientists, um, and I don't think that the future is, is especially for the mom and pop stores that we mentioned, is, is the higher data scientists. Uh, I think the future is for AI to develop to a point where no one actually has to analyze the data per se, um, because the AI solves for the problem itself. So if we operationally take an example, um, if, if, if a kitchen platform uh, is connected to an inventory management system, for instance, uh, after you sell out certain uh, items on particular days, uh, after a certain amount of time, obviously, the, the, through machine learning, I suppose, the, the, the platform just becomes smarter. So it can predict on certain days you're, gonna, you're bound to sell out of certain items. And instead of having a report that then someone has to analyze and then manually go and procure new items, the system can automatically reorder. Uh, and I think that's also sort of the the answer to the question, you know, how how to how to deploy AI for sort of the mass market. I think that's the answer. Is that it, it sort of uh, works by itself and in the background. It's not meant to be in in in, in the face of of people operating in the kitchen and in in, in the face of people who uh, interface with clients and customers on a daily basis. It's meant to make their life easier, basically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with what Phil mentioned. Uh, and uh, with time uh, in the next five years, what do you expect is that uh, the novelty of AI will wear off. Uh, people will get a better understanding of the technology, what it can offer. And basis that uh, then we will see it being adapted through SaaS solutions, uh, primarily where you don't need a team, you just plug it to your system and then it pulls the data and gives you the output in a format which you can use to make the decisions and uh, what steps to be taken next. Yeah, I think my, I'm pretty much in agreement with the, with the other panelists. I think in, in, in the future, I think we can actually take a lift, uh, let's say from some of the cloud service provider, uh, especially the large e-commerce platform players. Right. I think uh, it's very clear if you are a seller on those platforms, uh, it's very clear that uh, you do not really need to know AI or probably you're not even aware of it. Right. They will already be giving you the reports or the recommendation uh, based on the intelligence that they possess from trillions of data points uh, on a every minute or second basis. So I think the important thing is that um, how can we actually make such an environment uh, happen in Singapore? Right. Um, how can we actually allow the mom and pop shop to achieve this kind of uh, experience uh, without kind of uh, you know letting them go into the nuts and bolts of these technologies, and also at the same time making it uh, fits into the business case, right? Because we know that uh, the business case of a restaurant or FMB uh, outlet is clearly different from let's say a, a tech companies, right? So the, the whole business case is very very different. So I think from 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 our perspective, I think when we drive AI adoption from a government standpoint, I think we recognize that uh, there's, a, there's a very important need to address these kind of various uh, dimensions. And of course, from our point of view in the future, we hope that uh, right now we are also um, working with certain uh, companies that we feel that uh, they can eventually be the lighthouse per se. So we hope that you know through this lighthouse uh, uh, use cases, we can actually help to proliferate the, the, the value proposition to the rest of the sectors or the clusters. And of course, uh, hopefully uh, we can actually achieve some of these downstream uh, benefits uh, for, for all the companies in Singapore and, and yeah. So that's the kind of, uh, hopefully, the, the landscape that we want to see. Yeah. Super. Uh, I mean, I think 
our view about uh, AI and data really, I, I would say two parts. One, the data itself. Uh, I think uh, in the next few years, we will start seeing the data aggregation where all the different sources of data start coming together and uh, uh, and companies can have access to that wherein uh, you know someone is able to develop new solutions on top of the, that data lake, so to speak, uh, much more easily. The second is that um, uh, in terms of applications of AI, uh, uh, we personally see um, uh, the application of AI and data in almost every aspect of the restaurant uh, operations. Today, we just are talking about uh, you know, uh, uh, defining how the menu could look like uh, uh, leveraging uh, the uh, chefs and the data uh, and the chef's capabilities. Uh, we are talking about personalizing the experience when the customer is going to the restaurant and ordering from there. But uh, going forward, we really believe that um, in every aspect, uh, whether it is being able to uh, forecast the, the inventory, what Philip was also mentioning, uh, how much would I need in the next day, next two days, next week, uh, and being able to optimize uh, inventory, uh, uh, be able to optimize capacity utilization. I know what my trends of uh, how many tables are occupied uh, inside the restaurant, how many orders are coming, et cetera, and really being able to uh, leverage the data to optimize that as well. That data being connected to different promotion platforms where if I know that my capacity is going to be lower, uh, utilize, utilization is going to be lower for the next week, uh, I can actually run some promotions on the connected platforms and drive some more people to my restaurants. Uh, it can be even in terms of pricing where uh, at different times of the day, different uh, 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 the days of the week, the pricing can automatically, like if you look at uh, the, the, the airline or hospitality industry, um, the, the pricing uh, the, is dynamic, uh, some, something uh, to that extent where the pricing within the restaurant can be dynamic as well, depending on, uh, uh, depending on the time of the day, day of the week uh, and the customer base, et cetera, as well. So really in every aspect of, uh, of this f &B industry, we see that the application of AI is going to reduce these pain points and make it much more uh, innovative as we go forward. At least that's what our view and vision is. Uh, uh, we have a few minutes left, so I want to discuss one one last point uh, with this panel is on the risks. Uh, uh, everything is great, right? there's amazing amount of benefits and we are seeing some changes in uh, uh, the industry is slowly turning towards AI and data usage, but what risks do we see uh, in uh, in this space by leveraging uh, more and more data and AI in that uh, in the space. Any any comments on that would be interesting. Perhaps I take uh, take a quick step at it. I think from from uh, from our understanding, I think there's really a lot that uh, we need to put in place in order for the whole ecosystem and environment to to have uh, this uh, adoption in AI coming from the end of uh, this risk that you mentioned. I think first of all, I think uh, we have to ensure that uh, AI uh, is trustworthy, right? Um, and, and ethical use of AI is very, very important uh, because increasingly, as we mentioned, if you want a seamless experience, um, then in a way, AI will, will be a black box, right? And so you, in a way, the system, whatever thing that you see from the system, uh, the system needs to be fair. I think that there are already a lot of overseas cases where whereby, uh, there are certain ethical issues uh, with the use of AI, right? Certain uh, races are being discriminated, you know, and things like that. So I think uh, from at least from IMD standpoint, we are also working on it. Uh, we also have uh, we take a very concerted studies uh, from not just from the uh, so-called the policy standpoint, but also from a technology standpoint, how to you know uh, implement AI in such a way that is more transparent, more trustworthy, and at the same time uh, we can actually hopefully uh, explain certain parts of the, these uh, AI uh, processes. So I think that's coming from a broad overview perspective. Yeah, I I, I would. Absolutely agree with, with all of those points, um, and I, I think I come back to the the point of experience. Um, just because I guess we we Evanflow Evanflow we experience it every day because we're consumer facing. Um, I, I think the idea of sort of um, reducing a dining experience to something that's sort of uh, almost clinical is just not very appealing. I think people like the idea of of having a very personal um, experience, uh, 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 you know, something like, you know, people like to create memories when they go out for dinners, birthday dinners, 
celebrations, those kind of things. And I think um, one of the risks is that AI uh, removes that somewhat. So it becomes a little bit too, too rigid. Yeah, so to add on to uh, the other points that have been mentioned by the panelists. So the other risk that I see is that not finding the right balance with AI. So it might happen that people try AI and they completely shun AI. They say, no, this doesn't work. Or the other side, too extreme where people go just by what the AI is saying. I think it's important to find the right balance as that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, AI on its own is today not going to work. You need to find the right balance where you have the input from the AI and then the human is able to make a decision basis that. Interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, the, the, the f from our perspective, I think one of the big risks, definitely uh, the points that you guys mentioned um, make a lot of sense, but the, the safety and security of the data may also become extremely important because uh, uh, when you when you start moving towards a more open data economy uh, a misuse of that data can can be can be quite uh, dangerous uh, as well and that will again uh, really hamper the overall confidence on moving uh, towards that journey uh, as well. So I think uh, data safety, et cetera, will need to be extremely important uh, as we uh, as we grow uh, uh, the, the AI capabilities for the industry. Okay, um, we have a couple of minutes left. So let me, let me um, take uh, a couple more questions. Uh, there's a question from uh, Han, um, with all the benefits of AI for the consumers, the staff, the operators, is the so what? Bottom line answer, then be improving revenue profit at the end of the day, or at least for the most part. Uh, any uh, any of you uh, want to uh, talk about that? Yeah, I think, I think the idea is that it, it helps improve uh, margins, uh, ultimately. So it helps drive financial performance, uh, whether that's improving revenues through having um, better products and a better product offering, um, or whether it's through operational efficiencies that allow you to reduce wastage, um, uh, improve the, the, the lifespan of certain products that you buy. So it should be in, in definitely in both directions, I, I would say. Chris, Som, would you like to uh, add anything to it? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of, uh, I think we have to be uh, very, very clear in terms of the use case. That's why uh, when, when we go about uh, engaging the industries uh, to kind of convince them to use AI, we make it very clear that uh, a very uh, feasible business case needs to be established. So in this business case, right, uh, basically the, the we have to ensure that, you know, for example, if it's a recommendation engine, we have to ensure that uh, there is certain kind of upside uh, at the end of the day that can be achieved. Uh, the company can actually, uh, you know, uh, get an uh, increase in revenue be because of cross-selling or upselling kind of functionalities. And um, those are very important uh, factors. And also, as what you mentioned, uh, the other angle is also about cost efficiencies. So when we, for example, engage with the supply chain companies, um, those companies are actually, uh, there, there's really a lot of uh, very critical problem statement that uh, we are actually working on to, to improve their overall uh, operation efficiencies through the use of uh, AI and data. So when, when we put all this into the business case, and it will be then very clear to their stakeholders, especially the, the people that's actually, actually going to put the dollar to say that, okay, um, I'm willing to take this journey. Uh, and, and it's not just about the government giving me a one-time grant, but I will actually want to sustain this adoption uh, in the years to come, even after the grant finishes. So this is the kind of a uh, narrative that uh, we are looking into. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, any... Uh solution that you adopt either it should help you in increasing revenue or reduce the cost uh, if it doesn't do either then it will be a white elephant yeah yeah i mean uh, as i said uh, uh, i mentioned earlier from our uh, from our experience where we have implemented our ai system we have seen almost 15 to 20 percent higher uh, average check for the rest uh, for, for the customers ordering through the ai based uh, recommendation engine and uh, menu engineering and um, uh, that has improved the the revenue uh, for the restaurants and also the profitability um, because uh, increasing the revenue by even 5% adds a lot to their profitability. So we have actually seen results of uh, AI implementations 
uh, and uh, delivering additional value to the bottom line and the top line for the restaurants uh, as well. Okay, um, I think uh, that's um, our time. It's four o'clock, so I wouldn't take more questions. Uh, Brian, uh, I hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Anshu. Uh, I, I would like to thank all our speakers today, uh, Som, Philip, Chris, and Anshu for sharing their valuable insight and knowledge. Uh, I also like to give out a shout out to General Assembly for their help organizing this event. Um, for our audience today, do take note that we'll be sending out a post-event email with all the important information you could need, uh, including a recording for this webinar. So do keep an eye out for that. Uh, and with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. Thank you all for spending your Tuesday afternoon with us. And on behalf of SG Innovate, I would like to wish you all a great week ahead. And we look forward to seeing you all again at our next event. Bye. Thanks. Thank thanks. you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.